Right, so again, we're going to think about decision problems today, right? So, uh, I guess I need to do this. Full screen. Does it work? So we talked a bit about various problems with uncertainty and how Bayesian is in some sense optimal. Okay, so now I want to talk a bit. Uh, I mentioned that there was this proof for when regret uh, is minimized, and you also minimize, maximize the expected utility, which is fine. Okay. And we can talk a little bit about how we are going to talk about, well, uh, more, let's say, general decision problems. Okay. So now we've been talking about very simple decision problems. So now we'll talk about decision rules. So a decision rule is like a policy that tells you what to do in different inputs or in different situations. So this is kind of the type of stuff you have in reinforcement learning. So for different situations and what, depending on what happened in the past, you make a different decision. So something that probably everybody is familiar with is classification algorithms. Yeah. So you can think of a classification algorithm basically as a something that gives you a decision of what label to give to a particular instance. So you have some futures, they arrive at different times. So different time t you have a different future that you observe. Then you get some label. You don't get the label Im immediately, but there is some label that uh, you don't see. And you make a decision about what label to assign to the actual uh, observation. Right? It's valid to also say, I don't know what it is, well, for example. Or ask somebody else. It doesn't have to be uh, definitely giving a class to some uh, observation. Yeah. So the idea is that you have a decision rule, and for every observation that you, s you have, you have a different probability of taking a different action. And in a classical classification, you just say, OK, this is the class. Okay. And specifically in classical classification, the actions you take are the same as the space of labels. So your utility is also basically uh, one when you predict correctly and zero if you don't predict correctly. <coughs> so this is what this says here. Okay. So this is a trivial exercise. So uh, anybody should be able to answer this. Uh, if you have some model that tells you the probability of a class given the input, right, and you have this utility here, then what is the optimal decision to make? Yes? Pick the label with the highest probability. Yeah. So in this case, pick the label with the highest probability because if you write it down, then basically this maximizes this. So uh, the optimal According to what we talked about before, the optimal action is the one that maximizes expected utility. So that's our goal. We have defined utility to be zero when you are incorrect and one when you are correct. So basically, because this is zero for everything apart from the incorrect, apart from the correct label, then it has to be the one that maximizes the probability. Okay? So this is a basic decision problem for classification. Given a model, given utility as well, what is the action to take? Okay? Now, it gets a bit more complicated when you don't actually know the model, right? This is the usual case. You have some data, and from the data, you want to build a classifier or a decision rule that from data X, observation sets give you a label Y. Yeah. So here, it's a bit more difficult because you have some training data, and from the training data, you have to infer what's the right decision rule. So the basic way to do it in a completely probabilistic manner is to say that there is a set of models, P omega is one model, and each model gives you a different classifier, okay? Or a different probability for the class given the input, for every possible input. You can convince yourself that if you apply a standard Bayesian uh, theorem, what you get is if you have a prior probability for every possible omega, that is every possible model, then every one of those models gives you a different probability for the data you have seen. 
this probability is basically probability of observing these labels given these features. And this allows you now to compute a posterior distribution on all of these models. Okay? And why is this nice? It's nice because you don't need to do anything else. After you have computed this, which is trivial if you have a finite number of models. In practice, you don't have a finite number of models, so it's not trivial. But if it's a finite number of models, then you can just do the summation and you have your probability. And that means that you can now predict the, let's say, best class and expectation, given that you don't know what's the correct model. So you calculate a posterior distribution over all possible models. So for every model, you have a different probability. And every model tells you a different probability for the class given the data that you see now. And you just average all, all of them. Yeah. And this is basically your Bayesian marginal prediction. It's called the marginal predictive distribution. Okay, So the whole idea of this is you don't rely on a specific model being true. You just say there are many models. You don't know which one is true. I assign a probability to each one of them and average over all the probabilities. While in the previous case, you had a fixed model, and this model was a truth, and we're sure about this model. Okay. Now, this computation, we don't have to uh, go through it uh, or implement it or anything like that. Oops. Uh, but it's good to understand uh, the intuition behind it. So if you understand the intuition, then we can move on. Otherwise, I can take some questions here. You, you basically weight the models depending on how, how good they were previously. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this basically tells you how well the data fitted to the model omega. And you use your prior probability for the model omega. And then you have to normalize just so it becomes the probability. So then you average according to that. So that's a very simple idea. And if you are doing something like Gaussian process classification, this is what you're doing. OK. OK, so the last thing I want to talk about in the general sense about base decisions is that if you're talking about the setting where uh, the outcome, the, the right model, doesn't depend on your actions, like in classification, doesn't matter what you decide. In a sense, the right model is independent of, of what you actually do. So it's something that is existing in, in reality. And uh, we can talk about the utility of taking a specific action uh, under a specific prior distribution. And the interesting thing about Bayesian utility functions is that as you vary the prior probability, then you end up always with a convex function. So uh, I will go through this kind of quickly. Uh, but basically, let, have, let us have two different distributions, P and Q. It's one of them, our distributions on our models. And Z alpha be a mixture distribution, so anywhere between the two. So when alpha is 0, then we are Q. When alpha is 1, then we the, the prior is P. And anywhere between is a linear combination. So the first thing you can actually prove is that the expected utility for this mixture distribution is the same thing as the mixture of the utilities for the two. Okay. So that means that if you have, if you know the utility for one prior and the utility for another prior, or if one of the priors is actually the posterior, and you have calculated the utility of your decisions for one of these two distributions, then you can basically interpolate in between and find for the in-between distribution what the expected utility is. And this follows basically just from the linearity of expectations. Uh, the proof is basically just based on that. So this utility, the expected utility, is just integrating over all possible omegas under the distribution induced by this mixture. And then you just split the integral in two parts, okay? because z alpha is alpha p times plus 1 minus alpha q. So you put them in there, the integral is represented in two parts. One part is p, the other part is q. And this, by definition, is the expected utility for p, and this is the expected utility for q. So that's all. And the nice thing about this is that now you can actually show that the optimal decision for a given mixture, alpha, is always going to be larger, or sorry, smaller than uh, the interpolation of the two utilities for the optimal decisions. 
Uh, I will not actually show the proof. Uh, I will write through it graphically. Okay. So here you have a mixture between one distribution and the other. So here you believe it's distribution one, and then here it's distribution zero, and here you're in between. Okay. Now you fix some decision, some action, and the value of this action changes linearly because of linearity of expectations. If you choose another action, like d3 or d3, then again they change linearly. Now, if you know what the probability distribution is, then you can always choose the best action. So here you choose the red action, here you choose the green action, and here you choose the blue action, because they give higher utility. Okay? So for any given p, you pick the best action. Now you can continue doing this, and you see that every time you, have, you add more and more actions, you have this shape, which is the shape of the best possible utility if you know what's the distribution. And in the end, what you get is that you end up with a convex function. Yeah. So in general, base utilities have this convex property, and this convex property is important for approximations. And you can you will see it like in, a, in four or five weeks, uh, how you can actually use them. These are basic properties of base utilities. So now we go to the meat of the of the thing, which is equational problems. Um, so far, we had this problem where you observe some stuff and you make some decision, very simple. But now we consider problems where you have sequential uh, decisions to make. Uh, at time t, you see some observation, xt. You make a decision at, and you have some steps that you go through, 1 to capital T. And in general, you might say that how much you get in the end might depend in a complicated way on what you have done in the past and what you have seen in the past. But in most practical problems that we will actually use uh, this linear utility function. So the actual utility you get for a given observation and action sequence is basically a simple sum of rewards. And the reward that you obtain in every step is just a function of your action at that step and the observation. Okay, if you go back to the uh, classification problem, then you could say, okay, the total reward is the total number of correctly classified items and every time what you get in the reward doesn't depend on whether or not you have classified something correctly in the past. So this is a kind of classical uh, situation. If it's something more complicated than this linear utility function, then we usually cannot do a lot. Um, there are no efficient algorithms, basically, for computing the optimal thing. Okay. So I think this is a good point to introduce the what is called the meteorologist problem. Yeah, we already talked a little bit about meteorology uh, in the sense that we had a problem where you want to predict the posterior probability of rain, right? And we had also a small Python program where you had rain uh, or dry predictions, right? And you could calculate posterior probabilities for each one of these uh, weather stations. So now we're going to think about this problem as a decision problem more generally. So you have n stations, and each station mu i gives you a different prediction about what's going to happen given what has happened in the past. Okay. So you, as an observer, uh, at time t, you basically care only about the predictions of all the stations. So given the predictions of all the stations, and maybe the past, what has happened, you basically want to um, decide whether or not to take an umbrella or not, for example. Okay? So in this little exercise, uh, we can try and basically have something like the umbrella example, where you observe data from the stations, you calculate the posterior distribution on which station is correct, and every day you have to decide should I take my umbrella or not? Okay? That's the exercise. So what I'm going to do now is go to this thing here. And I'm going to make the font bigger. Okay, I'm going to swap this. 
this. So it's here. And I need to change this to X. Okay. Seems to work. Okay, I guess you can help see it or is it too small? Is it too small? had so far we had a posterior distribution right and we want to compute something from this posterior that's fine given observations now what would like to do extra now we have a sequence of observations okay and a sequence of models First of all, we have to define the models, what they are, and how they give uh, the predictions. Okay? So let's be completely random and just create completely random models. Yeah, that's fine. We don't care about that. So let's say that num p, as in p, num p, mon g somewhere. No. So let's make it here. So how can we do it? Well, okay. Let's say predictions is numpy zeros, right? Is it how you write it? Yeah. Um, actually, wait. Yeah, zeros uh, and models and t. Okay. So we have predictions for t steps. So let's say t is ten or a hundred. Let's say we have ten models. Okay, right. So now what we'd like to do is input the data, okay, range t, right? Um, okay, first we have to build the predictions. Um, so let's say build predictions. So how do we do it here? Let's say prediction t, uh, comma, Say more T. Mm, is uniform random uniform, right? Yeah. Dot random. Yeah. So have a model and prediction, but we have to also look to the models model in range and models okay so these are predictions so every model now gives us a prediction for rain so there's only one thing that we would have it's fine okay and let's pick one model and say it's the best model yeah, let's say that the first model is always the best and the actual probability of rain is coming from that model it doesn't have to be but let's say that okay so now let's say uh, run the problem I'll do the same thing. Okay. Uh, the rain is uh, okay. if uh, random uniform smaller than uh, what is it? Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, uh, model prediction one. Okay. First one. Sorry, zero. Yeah, actually zero in this language. Um, then we have to say rain. Outcome is one. Okay. Else rain zero. Okay. So now we should be able to learn from this, right? Uh, by saying posterior. Equal posterior, we know let's change the name of this. Get posterior. Yeah. Get posterior. Then you, 
So the if, the if you can get posterior, the if and p is the prediction, right? Uh, here I call predictions under p, so we'll actually call it problem. Prediction. I guess there's a little problem here, or is it not? Yeah. So I have to build a matrix of predictions which I don't have yet. I have to do it now. And <coughs> outcome is rain, right? Okay. Right. So this is what I have to do, but there's only one thing that's missing. This piece this thing doesn't exist. So I have to write now. P is equal to MP zeros. Uh, and moles, right? And two, there are two atoms. And now I just say P model uh, one is equal to uh, prediction model T, because that's the step we are in. And the, the other one, okay, sorry, the zero is this opposite. Okay, so half sum to one. So the model, of, this model predicts one with some probability and zero with the probability. So that's it. Okay. So now we have a way to collect the posterior and we just plug it in and, and we have finished. Okay. So this should work. Uh, but I will not test it now because I don't think we have so much time. But I'll, I'll put the code online so you can debug it if you like. Um, so, or maybe it was first time. Okay. So now the only thing that's missing is, is what, what the utility we will have, right? So what is the utility going to be? Well, let's say we have fixed time utility function. Uh, utility is equal to uh, NP zeros. And we have two outcomes. And let's say we have two actions. Take umbrella or not take umbrella, okay? And outcomes and actions just to make it clear what it is. Now we have this and we have the utility. We can just set, say that utility, uh, the rain we know is. Uh, so we don't take the umbrella, it doesn't rain and we like it. And. We drain the utility of the umbrella we don't like at all, and then if we take the umbrella, then we don't care what actually happens. Okay. Um, okay. So this is a yield function. So now we just want to maximize this. So to do this, we want to have a function that calculates what we said was the marginal, right? So that's the most important function here. So we have a prior, we have the model probabilities, right? And we want to get the probability of this outcome. Okay. So we don't need to do anything about the prior, we have already the prior done. So we just say um, outcome probability zero initially. And then we say outcome probability is equal to we just add that particular model's probability. Yeah. And we multiply it with the prior probability of that model, or the current belief about this model. So let me just change this and call it belief, just to be a bit clear. Okay, so this is a marginal predictive. So now we have the marginal predictive, right? And for any given marginal predictive, we can actually get the utility of our action. Yeah. So basically, you can say for array in uh, range n actions, right? For uh, y in range n outcomes, uh, u a. Okay, so say 
do a zero uh, initialize it and Ah, so we can um, let's call it Q. Okay. Q is there. No? So the, that's the square utility for the action. Okay. So let's first start with zero. Then what? What's the expected utility? And uh, it's basically is prediction. Uh, let's see. Get marginal. Leaf. How do you call it? Get marginal. Something new. It's a yeah, yeah. Uh, the leaf and Q have been fixed to an outcome, and then of course we have also oh, outcome is Y here. Okay. Of course, this should be later. Right? Of course, we haven't actually seen anything yet. So get marginal per leaf is your outcome, and we have to multiply this by the utility, right? And Y. Y okay, so that's the program, and now we have to take the maximizing action, right? If you want, now take action maximizing Q. So I'm just leaving this blank here. The interesting thing in this particular case is that belief does not depend on the action, okay? No matter what we do, we're going to see where, where it's going to rain. Yeah, so we want to see how well the stations are doing. So this part of the program doesn't depend on anything to do with the action. Okay. So it's a sequential decision problem, but it's a decision problem where the state of the world doesn't depend on our actions. Only our internal belief depends on what we see from the world, but actually our actions don't have any other effect. Okay. Uh, not even internally, so just affect to our utility. So it's a kind of simple problem in, in some sense. So you can fill it in and see whether or not by taking this action maximizing the Q, you are maximizing your utility really or not, and how how fast do you need to, how much time do you need to spend to actually uh, maximize your utility. But that's the basic idea of this program. Okay, so I think we've gone through enough of this. <laughs> Yeah, because you have the probability over everything, so this is the marginal predictive here. Yeah. Uh, so this basically you have the probability of every model, mm. and this half sum to one. Okay. So, and these ones are already these are already probabilities. Okay, it's not the like likelihood for the model. No, no, there's no likelihood. Data is no, no. So it's always like that. Uh, if you are Bayesian, uh, you always keep the posterior. Like this. So your likelihood is there, but then there's a prior, then you normalize. Yeah. So you almost never use the rule likelihood unless there is a computational reason. Okay. So basically, the interesting thing about this is that when you are when you think about the, your belief, your belief is kind of like a, you know, a state, a change of time, and you have some initial state, and then some next state, and then some further state. And you can even define the probability of going to a specific next state given the current state. And this is where it gets interesting. In general, a, a, Markov, a Markov process is a process where the state at time t plus 1, given all the previous states, only depends on the current state. So if you look at the graphical model, it looks like this. So, and we call this a transition cable of the process. Yeah. How many of you have seen Markov process before? Okay, everybody. Good. So it's interesting because if you if you look at your your belief when you observe a sequence of observations, this belief is also a Markov process, and it's a Markov process from two different points of view. The first point of view is I'll just change uh, here the scene. Point of view is the point of view of the of the agent, right? And the uh, other is the point of view of the world.
So from the point of view of the agent, uh, of the world rather, uh, you are observing some sequence xt, xt plus 1. Oh yeah, I have to also move that to the other window, I guess. Right. Right. Now it works. So you see a sequence of uh, observations, xt, xt plus 1, xt plus 2, and so on, right? And they all come from some random process, okay? They are maybe they're all independent. Doesn't matter. Now, the thing is that if you have you have your own state of belief, okay, let's call your belief XCT. And let's say that XCT is basically this vector. for all models. Okay? So this is a vector that has size omega. So let's say xt in r omega. If omega is finite, yeah. So in the n meteorologist problem you have n models and you have a different probability for every model which is your belief. Okay? Now there is one model which is the right one. Let's say that there is Omega star is the correct model. Okay, so according to this model, there is some specific probability, okay, of observing rain. So it's x here, given this omega star. Now. The interesting thing is that from the point of view of the world, right, observing a specific next thing depends on the complete history of what happened in the past. So it's it's a very complicated model, right? Uh, so what you have is from the point of view of omega star, it generates y1 and yt and yt plus 1. And yt plus 1 depends on yt, depends on yt minus 1, depends on y1 and everything. And your own belief However, it's a bit more interesting because your belief at time t only depends on your belief at the previous time step because that's what how you do the calculation and on the next observation. Yeah. You can't see that anymore. Yeah, okay. Right. So you have this kind of model for your belief. It kind of depends uh, on your on what is y t. This has a very complicated dependence, perhaps, in the past, according to the real model. But your own belief only depends on the past and not one other thing. This is still not a Markov process, however, because you have this other stuff that is connected to, right? So when does it become a Markov process? Now, if you're completely Bayesian, then you completely believe your belief. So you say, this is my belief, and I just do everything according to what I believe. Um, so if you have a specific belief, CT, that gives you a probability of observing something in the in the next uh, time step, right? So it gives you this. don't need to put a history here because your belief kind of already has a history inside okay so you basically you have a bunch of model and every model gives you a prediction you don't care if these models are doing something else so you have a bunch of models you have your belief and then this is a marginal thing so you can write sum of omega and then so every model gives you something might depend on an arbitrary way in the past. But according to your own belief, um, your next belief, well, will be a specific value that is only given by this probability. So this thing here tells you what's the probability of observing rain, okay? So this is probability of yt plus 1. So if for yt plus 1 equal 1, then this is your idea of what's going to be rain. So if you start from here, then 
with some probability equal to pct yt equal 1 you will go to a specific new belief which is the belief which you calculate after you observe rain and with some other probability according to what you think anyway you will go to some other belief in the future which is the same belief as before but conditioned on the fact that you have seen uh, dry weather okay so these are not the actual events these are like the possible events that you consider according to your belief and this is kind of like a mark of process now because uh, the probability of going here or there only depends on the belief that you have here it doesn't depend on anything external okay so the internal uh, belief process is, is a mark of process in this setting and it doesn't depend on your actions either because uh, your actions don't affect the weather in, in some sense right so so that's okay so that's basically the uh, the intuition of why this is mark of process so the element of this problem is actually simple right and it's simple because you, you always, always see everything. everything. Yeah. And the actions don't, you do not actually influence the predictions. And now we talk about partial information problems where you don't see everything uh, or your systems are dynamic. Now. So this is the standard setting in reinforcement learning. And both of these settings you can formalize them with Markov decision processes, which is an extension of Markov process. So there's a bunch of problems which are formalizable with Markov decision processes, shortest path problems of one stopping, reinforcement learning, advertising, and a bunch of applications. The basic problem we'll talk about is called bandit problem. So if you're in a casino and you have a bunch of uh, machines that you play, you imagine that one of them is the best and you would like to play that one all the time to gain lots of money, but you don't know which one it is. So what happens usually is you spend lots of time playing machines which don't give you any money and you lose. In practice, of course, you lose always in casino, <laughs> but it's theoretical. So, the basic application of bandit problems is efficient optimization. Uh, if you have this function to maximize, it's very simple. It's a sync function, everybody knows the maximum is there. But let's say I don't tell you what the function is, and let's just, just give you some uh, data from various points, x, not even the actual points in the function, but with some noise. So then it's harder to maximize the function because you have to test many, many points and for a long time until you find what's the real value of the function there. So what's the fastest way to actually find the maximum? Well, this you can do this with a band uh, algorithm. On an advertising, you can also think of it as a bandit algorithm problem where people arrive, you can see something about them, but you don't know what kind of ad to show them, so that they click on it. So uh, you can learn that. Clinical trials. You have a patient that's coming in and he has a disease and you have to do some experiments to find out what's the disease and what cure to give. But uh, it takes time to do all these experiments. You can just do every possible experiment on the patient. Uh, you can also do robot science. So you can have a robot that basically tries out different drugs and sees their effects uh, in different, uh, let's say, standard tests to see how promising they might be for uh, actually curing some diseases. You can do like thousands of drugs in time. Yeah. The problem always is that you don't have full information. So the experiment that you don't do, you don't see the result, right? So it's not like the meteorology problem where you can see all the meteorologists that say, this is my prediction, and this is what actually happened. No. You have to actually do the experiment. Yeah. So the stochastic arm value problem, you have a bunch of actions, it's like the meteorologist, and every action you take gives you random rewards. Now, there is a fixed expected reward you get for every arm. So there is a best arm to take. But the problem is that you don't know what's the best arm. So you don't know these probabilities, you don't know this expectation. Your utility is a linear utility. So you just want to sum over the sum of rewards. So that's fine. But the problem is that if you don't know the values rho, then it's hard to do it. And if you keep on playing the same arm, then you will not see the values of the other arms. You have to go periodically and play all of the arms just to make sure that you haven't missed out on a better arm than the one you're playing right now. Now we go further to more complicated policies. For the policy we had before, the classifier policy basically just say, okay, what's the current observation? 
this is my action. But if you think about it more carefully, the classifier problem, if you had the Bayesian classifier, then the actual action that you take depends on the complete history. Because from the complete history of labels and observations, you actually create your posterior distribution about what's the right classification mode. So if you are always getting more data as you're actually playing along, then your action, your classifier policy has to be kind of history dependent. Yeah. Of course, if you only get X and not labels, maybe you're not actually history dependent, but uh, if you're using a more sophisticated model like a semi-supervised learning model, then you'll be, you be completely history dependent even in that case, even if you're not getting any labels. Okay. <coughs> so what do you think the next action should depend on with history? For a bandit problem. Who says A? Who says B? Most people. Okay. Anybody say C, D, or E? Okay, good. So, yeah, we don't know the arms gives the highest reward, so that's basically the reason why. We're depending, we're learning. So we're doing a learning algorithm. And learning means remembering what happened in the past. So this creates a dependence for the complete history. That's all. So it's nothing super complicated. OK. Uh, if you have a stupid policy that's just uniform, then that basically gives you the average reward of all the arms. Yeah. So that's very simple. But we don't do that. We want to have a more complicated policy, something that learns something. If you think about more generally, uh, if you have any arbitrary policy, the expected utility is the expected sum of this. You can take the expectation inside, if you like. Then what can you do with that? Well, it's not very easy to solve it. Because what happens is you have the summation, you have the expected reward at MT, which is fine. But then you have to sum over the probability of taking a specific action given your, par your actual history. And you have to calculate the probability of this history. So to actually find the optimal policy right, for, for this problem in general, you have to think about the probability of observing some history somewhere in the future. And the number of possible things you can observe in the future is exponential in this capital T. So you cannot really calculate uh, the optimal policy. Calculating the utility of a fixed deterministic policy is pretty simple. Uh, sorry, a non-dependent, history-dependent policy is pretty simple, but calculating the utility of a history-dependent policy is not because you have to see what's the probability of observing every possible history, and for every history what action the policy takes, and then what happens. Right? So you have to consider every possible eventuality, like playing a game of chess or something. So as a basic uh, little exercise session today, we'll do the newly bandit problem where we have a bunch of bandits, uh, arms, which are Bernoulli. And that means that you get a reward zero with probability P and, or one with probability P and zero with probability one minus P. And we start with some prior belief. And then ideally we would like to maximize at any point in time T our future reward for all steps. So we don't just care about the reward right now. We want to play a policy that is optimal. Policy that maximizes expected reward until the end of the game. You can think again about it like chess. So you don't care about having a move that looks good right now. You don't have a move, a, a move that will win the game. Yeah. Then you have to think about what happens ahead. So in these kinds of problems, you don't just think about my current reward, but you say, okay, if I get this reward, then what will I believe about the game in one step. And then what will I believe about the game in two steps? So how can we actually do this? Okay. As an introduction, I'll I'll mention what is called Bayesian inference on Bernoulli bandits. So Bernoulli distribution is at zero one. And basically it's a distribution that you can think of a, of a coin that you throw and you can come heads or tails with some fixed probability. It's not true but let's say it's true. And and we don't really know what's the probability of coming heads or tails. So the usual way to 
uh, described, this is with the beta distribution. This beta distribution is a distribution on the interval 0, 1. So it can be used to model uncertainty about the Bernoulli distribution. Okay? Have you all seen this before? Yeah? Good. So if you have a prior beta which is like this, and you observe some sequence of observations, in this particular case, if you observe 100 throws of a coin, and 70 times it came head, then you have a likelihood that looks like this. The probability of different values of the Bernoulli model yeah, for the kind of observations you have. Then you can integrate the two, and you get a posterior distribution, which is kind of shifted towards the likelihood, uh, but is also moderated by the posterior. So this is a posterior distribution, which means if you integrate over this, you get a 1, while in the likelihood you don't get a 1. <coughs> now, the nice thing about beta distributions is that they only have two parameters, the alpha parameter and the beta parameter. When you start with some initial value, let's say 1, and then you add just the number of times you observe a 1 and the number of times you observe a 0. And, and that's it. So it's a very, very simple distribution, because you can summarize it just by counting Okay, so that's how you actually get these curves. So here you just say I had the prior parameter alpha, and then I added uh, 70 here and added 30 here because that's what the data was. Actually, I think the values were 10 and 10 for the alpha and beta. Okay, so how does this Bernoulli example work? Well, you have a bunch of distributions with unknown parameters. You assume that if you take action i, then you get a Bernoulli reward with parameter omega i. So the expected reward is actually omega i. And you have a beta distribution prior for every different arm, which is independent of every other arm. So you don't learn anything about arm A if you play arm B. Right? You just learn about the arm that you play. And the only things you need to remember is basically the total number of times you played the arm and the average reward you obtained when you played this arm. And if you have this, then your posterior distribution is uh, basically described by beta distribution always with parameters equal to the original parameter, the prior alpha, plus the total reward you obtain in the arm, and beta plus uh, basically 1 minus total reward of arm. As we saw before, there is lots of histories. So in this particular problem, the number of states that you can have, or the, the, the size of this tree, is basically 2n to the t, where n is the number of arms. Okay, So it's pretty large. OK, so as I said before, this state your internal state is a kind of uh, Markov state because it doesn't depend on anything else. It only depends on uh, itself. And you can predict everything about the future given the number of plays you had in every arm and then total reward. And this is how you can actually describe your belief or by the alpha parameters. And you can also have a marginal predictive distribution for actually obtaining reward equal to 1. And this is basically this ratio. Okay. To solve this problem, you can basically formalize it as what is called the Markov decision process, which we'll talk about later uh, in the course. Uh, but here is uh, an introduction. Um, so, Bandit MDP, so think about it like this you have some random, some unknown omega parameter that together with your action is generating rewards. The problem in the binary problem is you don't know this omega. So you don't know how to solve this, in some sense. So what we're doing uh, to solve the problem is we replace this omega with something that is known. And what is known is our belief about what omega is. So this is our belief about omega. And the interesting thing about this graphical model is that the rewards all depends on our belief and the action. And the next belief only depends on the action and the previous belief and the reward. <coughs> so the next reward is given by this distribution. The distribution only depends on our belief, nothing else. And from the definition of a belief, the next belief depends on current belief and the, the new observation. And the new observation is only this and this. So this is the only dependency we have. <coughs> so this is now what is called the Markov decision process, because we're trying to maximize something related to the sum of these. And then the states of the process only depend on each other and on, on the previous action. 
So the way to actually solve this process is by doing a back course induction that I'm programming or you have seen another maybe or while iteration. So it's kind of the same thing. <coughs> um, the basic idea is that the expected utility at any point in time is for the optimal uh, policy is given by maximizing over all possible actions and looking at the expected utility at the next time step. Of course, you don't know what the, util the utility is going to be at the next time step because you don't know the possible beliefs you might have. But you can actually calculate the probability of every possible belief because for every kind of belief and action, you can calculate the probability of every reward. And given a specific reward and a given action and belief, you calculate a new belief. So to actually demonstrate this, uh, I have a pre-written program which is partially working. So the first thing to remember is what we said was our belief. And our belief is basically these alpha parameters. So for every R, we have a different alpha and beta parameter, counting the number of times we get a one or a zero. Then we say that the marginal distribution is this uh, ratio of the alphas for every one of these. <coughs> so we can get the probability of observing a specific outcome very easily. And the posterior calculation is also very simple. When observer 1, then we increase alpha. When observer 0, then we increase beta. Now, the algorithm is actually just this. Um, you, have <coughs> you have the current reward. And the current reward that you get is actually equal to this marginal probability of getting a 1. If you get a 0, then you get no reward. If you get a 1, then you get a 1. So. Then you have to add this one to the expected utility at the next step. So here, this is just recursion, standard recursion. And with some probability, you get the reward of 1. So that means that you should update your posterior to see that, yeah, I have seen a 1. Or in another case, you say, well, in my posterior, it's going to be a posterior where you observe a 0. Okay, and that's basically how it works. Uh, it's a, basically this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven line program, 10, okay. Here to select the best action. So what you do is you go backwards to this program. Where you create, basically, by doing this uh, recursion, you create a, a large tree. Yeah. And at the end of the tree, you say, well, nothing happens now, so I just have the current reward. And then you go backwards and say, well, now I will uh, see the possible branches of the tree and I know the probability of every branch, so just average the utility that we get from that branch, and you go backwards. So it's pretty simple. The only question is, is this optimal or, or not? Right? And in what sense is it optimal? You said it works for finite parameters. Yeah, of course. Yeah. The other thing is the duality. In the return from the backwards induction is just true every time. Yeah. Yeah. So this is so this is it, right? So I, for every action, I have a different possible. So this p is the one thing I had in the program, the probability of going to specific next belief, and this is a specific next belief where you get a one or a zero. Yeah. So if you get a one, then you have a one here as well, 
And here you do the recursion and say, well, what's the utility of the next step? So it's, this is the same format as this one, right? So there's no, so the queue used internally to, to do the maximization. That's all. Yeah, so this is basically the structure here. How probabilities for different things happening uh, here. How the two last states. And uh, here you have two possible actions to take. And each action gives you a different reward here. And you have different probabilities going to the last states. So basically you average the next states, you get a value here, you add the reward, here it's zero. Then you select the maximum of the two. And that's all. So that's basically it about what is dynamic programming. And I will do a quick demonstration of why this is working in terms of actually proving it. If I can remember how you prove it. Okay. So what's the problem? Uh, let's do this. The problem is that we want to find policy maximizing expected utility. Okay? And we claim that if we do max a expected reward a t plus uh, sum of next belief probability of next belief given current belief and a t times expected utility t plus one given one and right so let's say that v star xct so that v star or let's call it v v xct is equal to uh, expected utility of this uh, under our backward induction policy then VXT is actually the maximizing value okay So what we're going to prove is that when we take backwards induction algorithm or uh, valid iteration, if you want to call it, uh, for calculating uh, the optimal policy or the optimal value, we actually get the optimal value and nothing lower than that. Okay. Right. So let me remember. Okay. So we have these steps, okay? That's the first thing. So at step T, uh, we just do max a T Okay. So Trivially, now we basically have the optimal. If it's just one step at the end, then we have the, the optimal uh, solution because it's the last step. So there's nothing to do anymore. Okay? Just a maximum. Now, the problem is how do we prove that if we continue going backwards, then we have solved the problem? Okay? So let's say that. Say that. I mean that at step three. Uh we already have the correct value. 
Yeah, because it's only one step. We don't need to do any. Uh, it's maximum. So by definition, it's the maximum. So we have finished. So there's nothing to do there. The problem is that if you go backwards one more step, are we still able to say that the solution we have obtained now for the two steps by first op optimizing for the last steps and then finding the best action given that we have fixed the last steps is the same as finding every possible s combination of actions to take in the in both steps. So I, I, I think I, I want to illustrate why this is not completely trivial. So let's say you have two actions that you can take. Okay, and these lead with different probabilities to different outcomes. So action one, action two. So you have four possible new beliefs, right? And now for each belief, you have a different action you can take again, and so on. So you have basically one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight things that happen at the end. For each one of those things, you can is a different. So basically, you have an action that is the optimal one for each one of these four states or beliefs. Okay. So if you play here, you don't care about what happened in the past, then there is an optimal thing to do. Now the question is: Is it still optimal for you to say that I will fix this to what is optimal if I don't care what happened in the past and just optimize for that? Yeah. It's you have to prove that basically. Uh, so the proof is kind of interesting because it comes from the name of the algorithm. It's, it's backwards induction. Uh, it uses the same structure as the algorithm itself. So what you say is that you remember the induction hypothesis, uh, how you do induction proofs, right? So okay. let's say that for n greater than or equal than t plus 1, we have that v star xct is actually equal or than the expected uh, value of any policy. Okay, so that's the induction hypothesis, right? Let's say that this holds already. We know it holds already for, for the last step, right? So let's say it holds for all steps from t plus 1 to capital T. Yeah. Uh, but we are not using n anymore. Let's, let's say for n greater than t plus 1, we have. Yeah, so it should be n here, yeah. Okay. Then we must prove. That it holds for t, okay. Right? Okay. okay. So what did we say V star C T was? Right? We said it was uh, maximum, right? Uh, over all actions at T. Uh, basically expected reward right plus uh, sum of probability of next step <coughs> given a t and then v star c t plus one okay that's how we define the algorithm. Now, by our induction thing, right? This has to be greater or equal So this is the same. So the only thing I'm changing now is this V star. So it becomes So this is true for any possible policy pi, okay, by the induction hypothesis, okay. Now, because I'm taking the maximum here, right, 
Now you can look at the combination of this action at this step and all possible poles at the afterwards as basically being equal than uh, greater or equal than for any policy pi. Okay. So basically this pi here and this at, because I'm looking at any possible pi and any possible action here. So now I can say any possible policy from t until the end. So I can just put everything here. T. Okay, which is basically exactly equal to the expected utility at time t. Okay, so that's basically what we have proven. So now we have proven by induction that backwards induction works. And we have proven it by backwards induction, basically. Yeah. So that's how it basically the proof goes. It's more complicated for when you have an infinite number of states, because then you have to kind of prove that uh, you're obtain the actual uh, optimal value but uh, I think that's not so important okay so we know this is basically what we have and we have kind of solved the problem and we can play a little bit with the program if we can make it work How? or we can actually talk if you prefer so why is it here okay So I try to make this problem more interesting, but uh, you like execute source something? Do you remember this command for executing the source file? Yeah, I have to generalize the program and I generalize too much. Uh, error here has no attitude ah, yeah, I was creating a new binary problem no, 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 there. I go. yeah here yeah, that should be a function call. Yeah. ah empty okay like this This now. Uh, why is this an error here? Binary problem k is equal to the only binary problem at number of arms. I'm creating a new binary problem, that should be okay. Yeah, but uh, you said it was close. What is? So I think you want. So the problem is in there. So here I'm creating it with no problem, right? So it works. Yeah. So here it works. So I can create it. Yeah, so in the transit program, instead of mt dot mt, you should put uh, mt array. Mt like this? No, no, no. Uh, yeah, just like that, but try the NSP. Oh, okay, that's not good. Okay, yeah. uh, okay, sure. Syntax errors. Okay. Well, maybe not inside. Maybe not inside. Inside the. Uh, okay. Non, at least? No, non, non. Okay. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, but anyway, but uh, we can play with output combined. Uh, she can divide some finish exercise. But how it works basically, uh, this is the backwards induction part. Okay. Uh, what we discussed. Very simple. Um, the binary problem itself just gives you a random reward. It has a number of forms, so here's the constructors and stuff. So here for a fixed binary problem in a given planning horizon, that we we'll, so this is for the actual planning and a given number of steps. Uh, we just run backwards induction and and take something. Okay. Now what happens here is that you always start the tree from zero, so you always plan ahead this number of steps. But you could change it so that uh, I will place zero with t so that you only plan ahead in the first t steps. And then you stop planning. And then you just play kind of greedily all the time. Now, okay. Basically, how this works is you can shoot on the, on the video now. But you will basically have a planning tree if you if you use t as an argument you will have a planning tree and you will go down the planning tree let's say for the t steps that you have planned where you actually observe t steps and then after that you will just be playing uh, in a greedy way so you will not do any planning anymore uh, that's how this works okay so here basically uh, this is just a test Ah, yeah, uh, that's just means an argument, okay, yeah. Yeah. Binary problem is the first argument, right? Yeah. Problem one. Yeah, let's say this is the first uh, problem K, yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Right. So this should work, I guess, now, maybe. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a new is not defined somewhere. Um, that's self new. That should be self new. And here. Yeah, no, at least I'm going to buy from the point. Yeah, it works. Yeah. <coughs> so basically, the first thing is just a test that shows that you can actually, the more deep you plan, of course, the more you get, you get. But that's your belief about how much utility you get. So it's not the real thing, okay? And, and this is how much utility you get for a 1,000 step problem. Uh, if you're planning ahead for zero steps or one step or, or two steps. So the interesting thing here is that the, you see that if you plan ahead for one step, it's better than for no planning ahead at all. But it doesn't make a big difference if you plan for two or three steps, you have to plan for much more to make a smaller and smaller difference and uh, actually now I'm doing a 100 experiments I think uh, yeah and it's not enough to see the difference statistically so you basically see the same stuff all the time but I'll just reduce the number of steps to say 10 or 100 so it's, so it's faster Yeah, when I said exponential in the horizon, it's exponential in the horizon, so it takes a long time. And sometimes you don't really see the difference if you're planning ahead for, for long. So here you don't really see the difference. Actually, it seems like the, without planning ahead, you get randomly more reward in this particular case. Yeah. yeah, that's basically how much you expect to change, like 1% extra per extra depth, but the depth is in is increasing the computation time exponentially. So it's not really worth it, and at least for these kinds of problems. Yeah. 
So typically there are uh, heuristic algorithms that can give you pretty good performance uh, in bandwidth problems. And actually looking one step ahead is, is like a heuristic. You have to look, if you look more steps ahead, then you might get something, but it's probably not, not so much. Uh, however, if you if you have a problem where there's a lot of structure, then it might pay to look ahead further. Um, it's not entirely clear which kind of problems benefit the most from for more complicated planning than others. So if uh, you look ahead, like for example here, you look ahead is smaller than the number of steps. Yeah. So what do you gain? Because it's not obvious, right? Yeah, it's not obvious. Uh, but you should get something because you are looking at the possible information gain you will have basically from your actions. So you are when you do looking ahead, you are exploring the possibility of maybe this action actually if I play it now to give me some information about what's the best arm. So I can play it in the next three moves as well. So it will give you some idea uh, of why it is. You can you can modify the program in various ways. Uh, one other way is to say that I'm, I'm, I'm planning ahead for three steps, okay? But instead of saying nothing happens after three steps, you know the program will continue for another 50, right? So then you have to look out for that. So yeah, I play my first three moves in however I like, but then I will have to commit to one action for the until the end. So here I'm kind of ignoring that, right? But if I don't want to ignore it, then I would basically write oh, well I don't have a horizon here so it doesn't work. But what you if you had the horizon here as well, then you would say that if you are at the last step uh, and there is no more planning to do, then instead of just adding the current reward, you add the current reward times the remaining time. Because you would keep playing the same arm no matter what happens. Your planning, and that will give you slightly different results, but not much. Okay. You will do times because well, okay. Let me switch. Okay, so let's say that you are. You have a ten-step problem. Or a, th a three-step problem, or I don't know, some-step problem, okay, for quite a few steps. And you have two actions you can play. Yeah. You know that if you play action one, then you might get some information that tells you it's actually epsilon bearer with some probability p. So with probability p, uh, action two is epsilon bearer. than A1, okay? With probability 1 minus P, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's worse. It gives you 0. So in that case, you basically lose something. Let's say, so you lose, let's say, mu. So if you play action, so if you, if you come into playing action 1 and you don't gain anything, play action 1, it gives you mu, and then mu for the second step, so you have 2 mu. Okay, so that's 2 mu. If you play the action, the other action, then with some probability, you get an epsilon bearer, okay? And with some other probability, you get the same. Uh, so let's say you have mu plus either p, mu plus epsilon, or uh, 1 minus p, zero right so th in that case you're basically gaining if you look at the difference between those two you're gaining something that is uh, p epsilon uh, versus uh, mu that's just for one step so if this is better if, if this is a positive value then you should play action two but now if you think about what happens in the future so you, if you discover it's just slightly epsilon better but you have a one million steps to play then it might still be worthwhile to play action two because you can discover it slightly better. You have a million steps to play, so it's worthwhile to play it now because you will discover it's better. Yeah. While if you only, so you, 
if you know your planning horizon is only k steps, but you have a million steps to play, then at the last step you should really uh, use the actual expected utility from the l from your planning horizon until the end of the game, rather than just saying nothing happens afterwards, because something is going to happen. So this uh, the program I have right now basically just kind of ignores it. So. Uh, I guess as a little exercise you can find and change that a little bit. Uh, you don't have to. But, but basically. Anyway, that's it for bandit problems, uh, introduction to reinforcement learning and how it relates to Bayesian theory and stuff. So next week Deve will talk about uh, Markov decision processes in, in the more classical setting, uh, where the Markov process is defining uh, an environment rather than your belief. But actually later on we'll see again how you can when you have a belief in an environment, you kind of merge everything again into one Markov decision process again. So you can basically have every problem as a Markov decision process. Yeah, we're finished. Wasn't this a good day? Yeah, yeah, we're finished. Uh, yeah. No. yeah, yeah. Okay.